This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we're going to continue the reading of the wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition, written by Philip van Limborch in 1692 and translated into the English language by Samuel Chandler in 1731, when this book was published. We continue in the introduction section part 3 with, with the remarks upon the history of the Christian persecution as we started already last time. And we have arrived at that we are looking a little bit more into the church's councils. Yeah. The councils of which Luther said when he was put in worms before the emperor to recant of his work of the, um, of the Reformation, that he said that the councils have erred in the past. And we are reading now about that history where the councils have erred and who erred in the councils. I find this quite an interesting subject. So without any further ado, let's continue on page, what is it, uh, page 97, where we stopped last time. And we're going to read on on the third and fourth general councils. Yeah, You had first the Council of Nicaea, that was the very first one. And then you had the Council of, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Constantinople right after that in uh, 320, uh, 328, 329 we read through that, you can look it up again so we are speaking now about the 3rd and 4th council today on the 3rd of April 2017 the 3rd and 4th general councils seem to have met upon an occasion of much the like importance the first council of Nice, or Nicaea, as you probably understand it better, determined the sun to be a distinct hypostasis or person from, but of the same nature with the father. You know, this is all this 
casuistry and sophistry about Bible definitions that even the people themselves do not understand. This is just ridiculous. Just take us as it is in the Bible. God is the Father. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son. Point out. You don't have to negotiate about the nature of Jesus Christ. What does that change? What does that change? Just have belief in what the Father of Jesus Christ tells you in his word. The second council at Constantinople, so I was right there, added, added, that the Holy, uh, added the Holy Ghost to the same substance of the Father and made the same individual nature to belong equally and wholly to Father, Son and Holy Ghost. So, who makes the Trinity? The Second Council at Constantinople added the Holy Ghost to the same substance of the Father and made the same individual nature to belong equally and wholly to Father, Son and Holy Ghost. This is what that council was all about. Now, let me ask you something. If you are to tell me what is my stance on the Trinity? I tell you the Trinity is a Roman Catholic invention. And you want to have proof? Well, read this sentence. <laughs> Among many other proofs. Read this sentence in the history of the Inquisition. It was at the Council at Constantinople that the Holy Ghost was added to the same substance as the Father and the Son made equally holy to the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, meaning, or as the author says, thus making them three distinct persons in one undivided es essence. Yeah? Making them, this is not what God says, God declares or God writes in his holy writ. No, the people, the bishops at the Council of Constantinople making them three distinct persons. Where, I ask you, give me scriptural reference. Where is the Holy Spirit ever called a distinct person in the Bible? A person meaning completely in itself, like Jesus Christ is in itself from the Father, and like the Father in itself is, uh, is, is on itself from the Son. Where is that with the Holy Spirit? Where is that with the Holy Ghost? Where is the Holy Ghost ever referred to as a person in the Bible? Never! I'm going to make it easy for you. You don't have to look it up. Never! Never ever! So simple. Huh? Thus making them three distinct persons in one undivided essence. But as they determined the Son to be truly man, as well as truly God, the bishops brought a new controversy into the Church, and fell into furious debates and quarrels about his personality. Nestorius, who was Bishop of Constantinople with his followers, maintained two distinct persons in Christ, agreeable to his two distinct natures. But St. Cyril, on the other hand, the implacable enemy of Nestorius, got a council to decree that the two natures of God and man being united together in our Lord made one person or Christ, and to curse all who should affirm that there were two distinct persons or substances in him. Tis evident that either Cyril and his council must have been in the wrong in this decree, or the two former councils of Nicaea and Constantinople were wrong in theirs, because it is certain, it is certain that they decreed the word person to be used in two infinite different senses. According to those of Nicaea and Constantinople, one individual nature or essence contained three distinct persons. According to Cyril's council, two natures of essence infin infinitely different and as distinct as those of God and man constituted but one person. Now comes the little highlighted sentence. Now how one nature 
should be three persons and set two and yet two natures one person will require the skill even of infallibility itself to explain so when you're a Roman Catholic, why don't you take this sentence up to the Pope and ask him, because in, he is infallible, when he speaks ex cathedra, meaning on dogma of the church doctrine. Yeah? When he speaks on the church doctrine, when he speaks about ecclesiastical matters, the Pope is infallible. It was declared so on the, second, uh, on the, Vat on the First Vatican Council in 1817. Now, how one nature should be three persons, and yet two natures, one person, will require the skill even of infallibility itself to explain. I agree. You cannot explain this. This is pure sophistry and casistry working with the work of God. It has nothing to do with church dogma, it has nothing to do with the gospel, and also has nothing to do with your salvation. When you believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, died for you on the cross and rose three days later to eternal life and will raise you up for eternal life if you believe in him, that's required of you. Not to split hairs as the Jesuits and the people in the different councils of the Roman Catholic Church liked to do and still like to do. Now, this whole sentence goes a little bit further, so I'm going to read it in its entirety now. Now, how one nature should be three persons, and yet two natures, one person, will require the skill even of infallibility itself to explain. And as these decrees are evidently contradictory to one another, I'm afraid we must allow that the Holy Ghost had no hand in one or other of them, meaning in neither. And this means that these councils are not led by the Holy Ghost. But they are led by another ghost. This some of the clergy very easily observed. Yeah, They were clergy, but they were not stupid. But they also see that these two dogmas contradict each other. And that the one dogma cannot exist when if the other exists. They cannot coexist. It's like preterism and futurism. <laughs> Just brings me to this uh, to this idea to comment a little bit on, on futurism and um, and preterism, you know, because I was just reading a booklet, the origin of futurism and preterism, which I'm going to read on my YouTube channel together with Tom Fress and maybe even uh, Brett Norman will join us, which would be wonderful. A little booklet that is called The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And in this book it is, it is stated, as everybody who has two working brain cells can make up for themselves, that these two Roman Catholic Jesuitical invented dogmas cannot exist next to each other. Because they exclude one another. Because Preterism teaches that everything happened in 70 AD or the latest with the fall of the Roman Empire in 410 AD so they are not even sure about when it happened 70 AD or 410 and the other dogma of futurism is that the uh, that the Antichrist will be a person who comes seven years before Jesus Christ returns which would be very interesting to see because nobody knows when Jesus Christ returns but they say we transport the last week of Daniel's 70th week prophecy of Daniel 9 into the future and that 70th week is a week of tribulation and before that we are all going to be raptured out anyway this is futurism and futurism and preterism are Roman Catholic dogmas by preterism from uh, uh, Alcazar, Louis de Alcazar in 1614 and futurism brought from Francisco Ribera in 1590 so and these two teach complete opposite things. Whether the end was AD 70 or AD 410, or the end is, pass, is uh, only coming at the end of time, somewhere in the future, undetermined. 
those two dogmas cannot exist next to each other and what we are reading right here right now these two dogmas cannot exist next to each other either this was even some of the clergy very easily ob uh, observed and therefore to maintain the unity of the person of christ uh, eutychus and dioscorus maintained that though Christ consisted of two natures before his incarnation, now we're going to get a distinction here between before and after incarnation, yet after that he had but one nature only. <laughs> but this, of course, was condemned by another council again, the Council of Chalcedon, which we already spoke about in earlier readings. And the contradictions of the former councils declared all to be true and rendered sacred with the stamp of orthodoxy. Now, when we cannot decide which council is true, then we're going to say just, oh, all councils are true, right? Now, this was also ratified by the fifth council under Justinian, who also piously and charitably raked into the dust of poor origin and damned him for an heretic. But still there was a difficulty yet remaining about the person of Christ. For as Christ being one person did not destroy the distinction of his two natures, it became a very important and warm controversy whether Christ had any more than one will, as he was but one person in two natures, or whether he had not two wills agreeable to his distinct natures united in one person. <laughs> Do you follow? <laughs> I have given up already. A long time with this casistry and sophistry, I just can't go along. This occasioned the calling this, uh, the sixth general council, who determined it for the two wills in which, according to my poor judgment, the author says, they were very wrong. <laughs> and had I had the honor to have been of this venerable assembly on uh, of this venerable assembly i would have completed the mystery by decrying by decreeing that as christ had but one person he could have but one personal will but however that as he had two natures he must also have had two natural wills how oh, I beg my reader's pardon for thus presuming to offer my own judgment in opposition to the decree of the Holy Fathers, who offer their judgment. But at the same time I cannot help smiling at the thought of two or three hundred venerable bishops and quote-unquote fathers thus trifling in council and solemnly playing at questions and commands to puzzle others and divert even themselves. Were it not for the fatal consequences that attended their decisions, it should look on them as bishops in masquerade, met together only to ridicule the order or to set the people at laughing at so awkward a mixture of gravity and folly. Surely the reverend clergy of those days had but little to do amongst their flocks, or but little regard to the nature and end of their office. Had they been faithful to their character instead of doting, which means being silly, especially as a result of old age, yeah, meaning had they been faithful to their character instead of getting Alzheimer's all through their dogmas about questions and strives of words whereof came envy, strife and railings. Uh, very interesting that the author uses this word railings here because when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11 we read that but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no not to eat. Railings being a railer, had they been faithful to their character instead of doting about questions, meaning bringing their Alzheimer <laughs> rooted decisions and questions and strives of words whereof came 
envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men and corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, they would have consented to and taught wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. But this was not the temper of the times. This is still not the temper of the times today. It would have been indeed more tolerable had the clergy confined their quarrels to themselves and quarrelled only about speculative doctrines and harmless contradictions. But to interest the whole Christian world in these contentions and to excite furious persecutions for the uh, for the support of doctrines and practices, even opposite to the nature and destructive of a very end of Christianity, is equally monstrous and astonishing. And yet this is the case for the Seventh General Council, who decreed the adoration of the Virgin Mary, who decreed the adoration of angels and of saints and of relics of images and pictures, and who thereby obscured the dignity and corrupted the simplicity of the Christian worship and doctrine. This the venerable fathers of that council did, and pronounced anathemas against all who would not come into their idolatrous practices and excited the civil power to oppress and destroy them. Now, this I find a very interesting sentence that I have to read again. And yet, this is the case of the Seventh Council. So, one was not enough, two were not enough, three, four, five, even six were not enough to set the dogma of the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, right. Why is that? Why can't these councils come to an agreement among each other? I can tell you, because they are not built on the truth. They are built on lies. And when you teach one lie, the consequence is that you have to go into teaching the next lie, to sustain that first lie. And when then questions about the righteousness of the, one, uh, of the first and second lie appear, you have to even bring up a third lie and the fourth lie, and the fifth, and so on, and so on. Because a house that is built on sand does not withstand a strong wind. When you build your dogma on lies, it is like trying to build a house of cards within a storm. And that's what they are doing. Nothing else but that's what they are doing. We are already here at the Seventh General Council. And this council decreed the adoration of the Virgin Mary. So that was something that was not made dogma in the First, Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth or even Sixth Council. No, they waited to the Seventh Council. Now all of a sudden the Virgin Mary is to be adored. But it also decreed the adoration of angels and of saints and of relics, of images and pictures, where when you go back to the beginning of this reading, you understood that images and pictures were forbidden. And that then all of a sudden one of the quote-unquote church fathers came and said, well, my people are so stupid they can't read, so I teach them with pictures because that's easier. And when they have these pictures, they have images, and they make images out of that, and those images, they all of a sudden bow down to, because man is just that simple. So this Seventh Council decreed the adoration of the Virgin Mary, of angels, of saints, of relics. What's a relic? Like a bone from a deceased saint? And... In the Roman Catholic Church, you can only be a saint when you're dead. Whereas in the Bible, the saints are the living. So a relic is something, part of a 
sacrificed and uh, sacred, not sacrificed, sacred body, yeah, as they call it, sacred body, a holy body. But you know, nobody can make anything holy but God who is in heaven, because only He is holy. But they declare things to be holy. A relict is a part of a deceased person, a body part or whatever, or something that he touched, something that he drank from, something that he wore, things like this, relics. And this seventh council decrees the adoration of relics and of images and pictures, and who thereby obscured the dignity and corrupted the simplicity of the Christian worship and doctrine. That's the point. The simplicity the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine, because that is something, and that is that is like like a like a like like a way that we can still see today. If something is not difficult, if something is um, doesn't take years of study of learning, like when you go to school and university and all that stuff. If, if something is not that difficult, it's just not, it cannot be true, it cannot be interesting. When, when something is simple, well, uh, no, that, that's not possible, then it can't be true, because no, nothing is that simple. But the simplicity of the Christian worship and doctrine is simple, as it says. This the Seventh Council corrupted the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. Now, what is then so simple about Christian worship and doctrine that they corrupt here? You want to talk about that? What is so simple? So simple is that God gave us Ten Commandments. You know? Ten Commandments. And I know I did that already before in one of the readings here that I opened the book of the Bible, King James Version, in Exodus chapter 20. What is the simplicity of the Bible? I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Simple. Easy. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Okay? So, what did we just read? This Seventh Council corrupted the simplicity of Christian worship by decreed adoration of the Virgin Mary. Now, this goes in against the first commandment that Jesus read. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So, when I am ordered by the church to give adoration to the Virgin Mary. What is adoration in another word? But as God says here, thou shalt have no other gods before me, making the adorated persons or images or idols or whatever equal to God. Romans chapter 1. I don't go into that right now. No. I'm not going that far away from the book, but I think that this is really something we absolutely need to talk about at this moment here. When this Seventh General Council says, and decrees, it decrees, means it orders, it makes it dogma of the religion of the Roman Catholic Church, the adoration of the Virgin Mary or of angels, or of saints, of relics, of images and pictures. This is everything that we just read in the first two commandments against. And make these two first two commandments null and void. Now the next commandment says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. You have to show respect he is the potter, and we are the clay. 
Is the clay to say to the potter, what doest thou? I don't think so. We have to respect him and not take his name in vain. That is the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day it goes on to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day the Sabbath is of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy maidservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Who blessed the Sabbath day? The seventh day? God. Who blesses the first day of the week, Sunday, and blesses this? The Pope. Who do you adhere to? The Pope or God? Very easy question, right? The simplicity of the Christian worship and doctrine. Six days shalt thou work, and the seventh day is of the Lord thy God. Because he made heaven and earth and the waters and everything that is in them in six days, and rested the seventh, and sanctified it. God sanctified it. He blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother. Well, that's not so hard to do, right? It's very simple. There are two people that brought me into this world. Two people of flesh. My father and my mother, they got together. And because of that, I came into existence. And therefore, I have to honor them. Because if I cannot even honor my earthly father and my earthly mother, how in the world can I even honor my father who is in heaven? Thou shalt not kill. Simplicity of Christian dogma. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Tell the truth, because when you start with a lie, I just explained to you in this reading what happens. One lie begets another. It cannot be any, anything else. Because it always had to hide, has to hide the truth. That's why people say the truth is hidden under a mountain of lies. And that's the truth. Because if there were no truth, there were no lie. You only have to invent the lie because you want to hide the truth. Otherwise everything was truth. That's how it was in the Garden of Eden. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Tell the truth. Be a man. Take the consequences of speaking the truth. And last we, lead, we read, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Ten Simple commandments that will never change because God's word will never change. That is the simplicity of the Christian worship and doctrine. And as the author says here, that with this general council that decreed the adoration of the Virgin Mary, of angels and of saints, of relics, of images and pictures, and who thereby obscured the dignity and corrupted the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. It is that easy. God tells us in his own words, simply and easy, how it is and how he is to be understood. We don't need one, two, three, surely not seven different councils, and there have been many more. We are just speaking about the seven councils here. Okay? Go back to the simplicity. That was the Reformers' Creed in the time of the Reformation. Sola Scriptura. 
we have one book in which God reveals himself to us, in which God gives us the guidelines for this life. Plain and simple, nothing else. No human philosophy, no Grecian philosophy and psychology from Plato and Socrates and uh, all the other so-called smart people of the old Grecian Empire or the so-called smart Germans of the 16th, 17th and most of all 17th, 18th and 19th century like Schopenhauer and Freud and Nietzsche and all these people who did nothing else but pervert the minds of the people. We don't need all that. All we need is the simple word of God. All we need is the Bible. The simple King James Bible. Yeah? No more and no less. The simple King James Bible. Let me see. Do I have this picture here somewhere? No, no, that's not it. But anyway, I don't have a picture of the Bible to put right here, but... You understand what I'm saying, right? The point is... Uh, it's, it's not easy to find here, okay. The point that I just want to make is the point that the author wants to make. The simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. The simplicity lies in that it is so simple as God says it. When God gives us an Exodus, which everybody can read, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 11, uh, 1 through 17, gives us the Ten Commandments under which that we should live and with which we should live. It is that simple. We don't need any decrees and councils and clergymen who tells us this and that, who tell us this and that. No, we don't need that. We just need to adhere to the word of God. Sola Scriptura. Now you're going to say, yeah, but you know, we had different uh, reformers. We had Luther, we had Calvin, we had this and those and that. And they all said they adhered to Sola Scriptura. But yeah, but they didn't. And that was the problem. And because they didn't, that brought in division. And that brought, brought so-called different denominations. <laughs> Brett yesterday made a video that I found very interesting in this regard because he asked, what's a denomination anyway? What, what, what kind of word is that? We all know what a nomination is, so what is a denomination? Interesting question, right? Well, find out um, when he publishes his video and uh, look it up what that's all about. Nomination and denomination. Uh, of course we don't need different denominations. We have only one <laughs> I'm going to use the word now, denomination. And that's the Bible. Simple as that. And that's exactly what the, re what the author wants to tell us, tell us here. So let us listen to it. This council corrupted the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. And I just ex tried to explain to you what is the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Now the author continues, This the venerable fathers of that council did, and pronounced anathemas against all who would not come into their idolatrous practices, and excited the civil power to oppress and destroy them. This the venerable fathers did, of that council did, means they corrupted the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. Not they taught, uh, don't get this misunderstood, not they taught the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine. No, 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 no. They, the venerable quote-unquote fathers of that council, corrupted the simplicity of Christian worship and doctrine and pronounced anathemas against all who would not come into their idolatrous practices and excited the civil power to oppress and destroy them. In other words, 
when you do not believe what we tell you to believe, we will send out our hound dogs, which is the civil power. And they will tax you into oblivion and they will take everything from you that you have and we will make you listen to our dogmas or else. And eventually it turns out to be one point, this or else. And this is what the whole book actually is going to be all about. Convert or die. Or convert and die. Because it is not because you are in the fangs of the Inquisition that you have to, that you have a possibility to come out of it once you're in the fangs of the Inquisition. It is not that when you convert because of torture that then you are being left alive. Oh no. That's not how they work. Convert or die. But we're going to go that into that a little bit later. Next is point three of uh, the subject that we are talking about today. Remarks upon the history of uh, the Christian persecution. Still in the introduction, as it is said, introduction uh, part three. Surely, the author continues on the bottom of the page uh, 98 here. Surely it could not be a zeal for God and Christ and the truth honor of Christianity to real love and piety and virtue that prompted and led them on, those, uh, on these acts of injustice and cruelty. Without any breach of charity, it may be asserted of most, if not all of them, that it was their pride and their immoderate love of dominion, their immoderate love of grandeur and riches that influenced them, that influenced them to these unworthy and wicked measures. The interest of religion and truth, the honor of God and the church is, I know, the stale pretense, but a pretense, I am afraid, that hath but little probability or truth to support it. For what hath religion to do with the observations of days? Or what would excite Victor to excommunicate so many churches about Easter, but the pride of his heart, and to let the world free, the world free how large a power he had to send souls to the devil? How is the honor of God promoted by speculations that have no tendency to godliness? Will any man seriously affirm that the ancient disputes about and here follow a, uh, follows a little sentence of Greek words that I cannot read and the rest of the hard words that were invented did any honor to the name of Christ or were of any advantage to the religion of his gospel? Or can he believe that Alexander, Arius, Athanasius, Macedonius and others were influenced in all their contentions and quarrels and all the confusions they were the authors of and the murders they occasioned purely by religious motives? Surely the honor of religion must be promoted by other means and genuine Christianity may flourish and indeed would have flourished much better had these disputes never been introduced into the church, or had they been managed with moderation and forbearance. But such was the haughtiness of the clergy, such their thirst of dominion over the consciences of others, such their impatience of contradiction, that nothing would content them but implicit faith to their creeds, absolute subjection, to their decrees and subscription to their articles, absolute subjection, uh, uh, sorry, um, absolute subjection to their decrees and subscription to their articles without examination or conviction of their truth. Or for want of these anathemas, depositions, banishments, and deaths. The history of all the councils and of almost all the bishops that has left us is a demonstration of this sad truth. 
what council can be named that did not assume a power to explain, amend, settle and determine the faith? That did not anathematize and dispose those who could not agree with their decisions? And that did not excite the emperors to oppress and destroy them? Was this the humility and condescension of servants and ministers? Was not this lording over the heritage of God, feasting themselves in the throne of the Son of God, and making themselves owned as fathers and masters in opposition to the express command of Christ to the contrary? Now we go into Clemens Romanos, and I don't know if you are aware of who Clemens Romanos is, that's why I uh, looked him up and, uh, and uh, gave a little exp uh, excerpt here that we can understand, it because also on that excerpt I have a little comment. Clemens Romanos, or Saint Clemens' name, is the Roman canon of the Mass. Yeah? St. Clement's name is the Roman canon na name of the Mass. He is commemorated on 23rd of November as a Pope and martyr in the Roman Catholic Church as well. And now comes the important point. Listen please closely. He is commemorated on 23rd of November as a Pope, probably even the first Pope after Peter, they say, and martyr in the Roman Catholic Church as well as within the Anglican Communion and the Lutheran Church. We also have the Syriac Orthodox Church, the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church and the Greek Orthodox Church as well as the Syriac Catholic Church, the Syro-Malankara Catholic Church and all Byzantine Rite Eastern Catholic Churches they commemorate Saint Clement of Rome, called in Syriac Mor Clemis, on the 24th of November, meaning one day later. The Russian Orthodox Church commemorates Saint Clement on the 25th of November. So, it's whether on the 23rd, 24th or 25th that this Clemens Romanos that we are going to read about now in the book is being commemorated in the churches but not only in the Roman Catholic churches, but also in the Lutheran and Anglican and all quote-unquote Orthodox churches. This, and this is why I put that out, is the result of ecumenism. That is ecumenism. That they, the Lutheran church, why in the world would a Lutheran church commemorate Clemens Romanos, who the Roman Catholic Church venerates as their first Pope. Because of ecumenism. Because the Lutherans have left their belief system. Elvis has left the building. The belief system is out of the once Protestant Lutheran Church. It is out of the Anglican Church. It is out of all the other churches that were named here. Because they all commemorate the same. Clemens Romanus in this case. I just wanted to make that little extortion, uh, excursion into ecumenism. That you can learn more about when you follow my book reading of uh, All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael Desemlian or what um, Tom Fress uh, is uh, at this moment in April 2017 working on on First Amendment Radio and Inquisition Update uh, the successor to the book All Roads Lead to Rome from the same author uh, which is called The Foundations Under Attack the roots of apostasy. There you can really learn about what ecumenism actually is. And uh, this is just one of the examples that I just wanted to bring to you. That St. Clement's name is in the Roman canon of the Mass. He is commemorated on the 23rd of November as a Pope and martyr in the Roman Catholic Church. As well as within the Anglican Communion and the Lutheran Church, which are both supposed to be quote-unquote protestant meaning 
to protest the Pope as the Antichrist that he is. Now, Clemens Romanos, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, in chapter 44 uh, of his writings, I think, because Corinthians don't have 44 chapters, tells us that the apostles knew by the Lord Jesus Christ that the episcopal name and office would be the occasion of contention in the Christian church. At noble instance, says the learned fell, in his remarks on the place of the prophetic spirit of the apostolic, uh, apostolic age. Formerly, he adds, that men's ambition and evil practices to obtain this dignity produced schisms and heresies. Very important sentence. I'm going to highlight it for you. Formerly, he adds, that men's ambitions and evil practices to obtain this dignity, meaning the office of bishop, and, of course, the Pope is just the Bishop of Bishops, that this, to obtain this dignity, produced schisms and heresies. A schism is a different understanding of the dogma, like the schism we had in 1054 between the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox Church. That's a schism. And heresies. I don't need to explain what heresies are. Eh? Anyway, it was indeed no wonder that such disorders and confusion should be occasioned when the bishoprics were, uh, were certain steps not only to power and dominion, but to the emoluments, uh, em emoluments and advantages of riches and honors. When you became a bishop, you were rich for the rest of your life. Nothing changed. <laughs> it's today still the same. Even long before the time of Constantine, the clergy had got a very great ascendant over the, over the laity and grew, many of them rich, by the voluntary oblations of the people. But the grants of that emperor confirmed them in the worldly spirit and the dignities and vast revenues that were annexed to many of the seas, meaning bishoprics, gave rise to infinite evils and disturbances. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. So they would but get process, uh, pro, uh, profession of them. Uh, no, 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 sorry. So they would get possession of them. They cared not by what means, whether by clandestine or, uh, ordinations, by scandalous simony, meaning buying of office, comes from Simon the Sorcerer, the expulsion of the possessors, or through the blood of their enemies. Very important point that I made a little bit, I think, within the reading, uh, if you remember that, and otherwise I look it up, on my uh, main YouTube channel, Joggler66, um, where I uploaded a video, you can see that directly here, I was just, really just watching a little uh, car racing here. Uh, I made a video a few, uh, few days ago, last week or something, when I was in the car, um, that was called Code Word Babylon Intro Morals of the Jesuits. And with these Morals of the Jesuits, um, it was clearly uh, to see what we are reading about here, or through the blood of their enemies, it says, that uh, the Jesuits bend moral morals in a way that a normal man can't even understand, that even to kill your enemy when you gain an advantage of it is a meritorious work that the Jesuits see as a as no sin. As absolutely no sin. And this is exactly the same thing that comes out here. Whether by clandestine ordinations, by scandalous simony, the expulsion of the possessors, or through the blood of their enemies. Even when I have to kill them. The only thing and it's important is that I get their possessions. And that is, and that is righteous because the end justifies the means. 
because by whatever means necessary, when I gain of it and I work for the victory of the church, call it that way, then everything is allowed. Now, how many lives were lost at Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria and Antioch by the furious contentions of the bishops of those seas, deposing one another and forcibly entering upon possession? Would Athanasius and Macedonius, Damasus and others have given occasion to such tumults and murders merely for words and creeds had there not been somewhat more substantial to have been got, uh, to have been got by their bishoprics? Would Cyril have persecuted the Novatians had it not been for the sake of their riches, of which he plundered them soon after his advancement to the Sea of Alexandria? No. The character given by the historian of Theodosius, Bishop of Sinada, may be too truly applied to almost all the rest of them who persecuted the followers of Macedonius, not from a principle of zeal for the faith, but through a covetous tempter and the love of money, which is the root of all evil. This St. Jerome observed with grief in the passage cited on page 31 of, his, uh, of this introduction. So we read already a little bit earlier about that in this book. And Amenaeus Marcellinus, a heathen writer, reproached them with in the passage cited on page 39. So, while you go back to the cited pages 31 and 39 and can read that again, I will end this video for today, the reading of the book History of the Inquisition by Patrick von Limborch. And I hope that I made here and there a little bit a point. I thought I would come a little bit further than this few pages that we read, but I don't care how long it takes to get through this book. I will get through this book. I absolutely will. And I try to make the simple points that the dogma of Christianity is easy. Everything in this world, which is the world of the Antichrist, is difficult. But the Gospel and the way to salvation, God and His simple Ten Commandments, which Jesus even brought down to only two, love your Father, your God in heaven with all your heart and mind and soul and power and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there are some people who I know who don't even love themselves. If you don't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? So, Jesus Christ brought the Ten Commandments down to these simple two ones. The Gospel and the Bible is simple and that is something the devil just doesn't want you to acknowledge that's why you have to study all your life to get an understanding of things that could be so easy thank you for watching thank you for listening thank you for commenting until next time Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says God bless you and bye bye